And I, I worked my ass off trying to get your attention back, to prove myself to you, to make you like me again. But the more, the more I did, the less you cared. It's like I was fucking invisible. So, I am a counsellor and psychotherapist, and today we're going to analyse the character Nate Shelley from the show Ted Lasso. We're going to discuss uh, all of him, really, why he behaves as he does, perceives events the way he does, what can his role in the show teach us about his deeper feelings, and then also discuss the likely direction Nate Shelley would take things in the soon-to-be-released season 3. What would make psychological sense to happen next in terms of him? If you haven't seen season 2 of Ted Lasso then I recommend watching that first because this video will provide spoilers on probably one of my favourite character arcs from anything maybe and if you haven't seen Ted Lasso at all you can check out my other video talking about healthy masculinity to do with it that might be of interest. In general feel free to comment your thoughts, things I get wrong or I miss, I know he's a fictional character but people in general can't easily be summarised to a comprehensive level in any size YouTube video so there's always space to discuss and add to what are essentially just my thoughts. But yeah, let's get started, beginning I think with the most obvious side of Nate, which is his growth throughout the first season. Nate's position at the beginning of the show is pretty clear. He was actually the character I found the least interesting to begin with, because it appears like he's going to be that typical kind of stock character you do get from time to time. The very shy bloke with low self-esteem who feels unable to ever assert or express himself. A character whose struggles you laugh at and yet also feel great sympathy for, such as Ted from Scrubs, another show with Bill Lawrence's input. Do you feel confident about this, Ted? I'm not sure. I don't know what confidence feels like. What are you afraid it's going to happen if you don't? That you won't like my idea and it makes you hate me. Then you fire me. Then I have to move back in with my parents and they'll be ashamed of me and then everyone finds out back home and laughs at me until my face melts off. Excuse me. And to an extent, yeah, Nate does adhere to that slightly one-dimensional archetype. That's how the show directs us to look and think about him initially. Nathan is shocked that Ted wants to know what his name is, he's equally shocked when Ted remembers. When he has good ideas, he feels too afraid to share them for fear of being shot down, and he's bullied quite horribly by Jamie, Colin and Isaac, because he's not quite able to stand up for himself. I think early scenes of Nate do tread that line between something to laugh at and feel sympathy for. The idea of sympathy I think is actually a key point in all of this and we'll come back to that later. But as a pretty clear example, in one of the first scenes with Nathan we see him escorting Ted to meet Rebecca in her office where Hello. he comes in, freezes, then runs off. And he then actually comes back a moment later in the background before seeming to change his mind and leaving again. No attention is drawn to that yet, but you can only imagine how much he must chastise himself over his anxiety there. I think it's touches like this that indicate we're going to see a deeper side to Nate beyond that stereotype. Touches like that that make you realise this isn't anxiety existing uh, solely for a joke, but that there's a properly developed character there. Nathan is also quite clearly quick to scold himself over pretty much anything, as well as to expect scolding from others, even from the nicest man in the world, Ted, such as Try and Nate's sports mix. Mm -hmm. Oh god, what? You know, suddenly Nathan appears like a child in school expecting his teacher to tell him off, except, of course, it's the reverse. But you continue to impress, Nathan. You remember the name. You know, when he expects certain punishments from someone who has given him no indication whatsoever to expect it, that suggests there's something more to do with Nathan himself going on here. Ted is super nice, but he's a man in a position of power. He's the team manager, therefore he's probably going to chastise me. And even with all the time Ted devotes in season 1 to help Nathan feel valued and encouraging him, one of his first discussions with Ted in season 2 still has him doing the same thing. Pressure makes pearls, right? Mm. Wait, that's wrong. It's diamonds. It's shit. Messed it up. I know it's an obvious point to make, but it's still an important one. Sometimes the reason we expect a certain type of treatment from others is because there's a little bit inside of us that thinks we deserve that treatment. Sometimes. Nathan is relentless in punishing himself for the tiniest of things imaginable. And perhaps 
in that context, it's entirely unsurprising he shows no ability to stand up to Colin or Isaac when they bully him. Maybe, it is conjecture, but just maybe there's a little part of Nathan that thinks he deserves the bullying and therefore allows it. We'll come back to the feel of punishment later when we get to his father though. For now, the arc of season 1 in terms of Nathan is the cliche, satisfying, wholesome one you'd expect of Nathan in this sort of story. A positive upwards trajectory going essentially from a kit man people don't always know the name of, someone in the background only ever brought into the spotlight when it's to be bullied, and he grows instead to become a respected and important first team coach. Nathan just needs some confidence. That's what the message appears to be. Nathan just needs to learn how to assert himself, then he'll be fine. Just be assertive. Yes, yes, yes. Brilliant, spectacular. Lovely, wonderful, it's wonderful. <laughs> we hear so much, I think, about the importance of finding confidence in life, but there is a difference, I believe, between confidence and ego. Is it confidence, for example, that Nathan finds during his teen talk when he moves from very nervously stuttering to this? The only Afghan I know more in prison by their own thoughts is goddamn Nelson Mandela. <laughs> is that confidence or something entirely different? Season 2 reveals a lot more to Nathan, all of which we're going to get into, but I'm actually going to begin with a very simple but crucial point about his suit. So, let me explain the situation first. In Season 1, they all have to attend a charity event. Nate, who owns no suits himself, opts to borrow one of his dad's, except, of course, it fits badly and doesn't look great, so Ted, spotting this early on, offers to buy him his own one instead, a kind act to help Nate feel more confident at the event. Except, after wearing it for many other occasions, it comes back round in Season 2 when Nate wears the same suit to a funeral. Is this the suit that Ted got you? What the, yeah. this? Mm. Um, can't remember. Uh, yes, yeah, yeah. Another man buying you clothes is infantilizing, yes? Well, no. You don't buy all my clothes. Most of them are gifts from my mum. You... This, of course, wounds Nate's pride a little. It would do, I think. As such, Keely ends up taking him out to find a suit he can really call his own with a style that suits him. <laughs> no pun intended. Um, but that he can feel confident in. I guess there's two things here. First, Nate ends up picking a suit very similar to the sort Roy Kent always wears, which is very striking. It does make me wonder how much Nate hopes to be like Roy, this tough man he's seen as captain of the team for years, a man who shouts and swears and commands all attention. You listen to me! Roy is an intimidating, strong figure. Powerful is the key word, we'll see just how focused Nate is on power. Obviously I did talk in my masculinity video about how Roy Kent is also very thoughtful and sensitive and many other things, but on the surface he appears incredibly macho really. A box to box midfielder and captain of a football team would need that. Does Nathan see the thoughtful and sensitive side of Roy or just the toughness though? A first introduction to Roy way back in episode 1 of season 1 actually has Nate arguing against Coach Beard for Roy's greatness. Definitely lost a step. But you know, he's a legend. Won a Champions League with Chelsea so... Eight years ago. There's something about Nate's behaviour when he thanks Roy for telling Colin and Isaac not to bully him anymore that feels a little idealistic. Um, Roy is Nate's heroic saviour. The close cling and the hug looks faintly like a kid holding their parent. I hope that makes sense. I don't mean it in a critical way as well, it just adds to this feel of Roy Kent as a powerful idealised presence in Nate's eyes, a saviour. I just have to wonder if Nate looks up to him a great deal, the strong man. In the final episode of season 2, Nate looks completely shocked to hear Roy confess that Keeley's photo shoot hurt my feeling. How could anything hurt Roy's feelings? He's invincible. That's not right. In fact, though a little tenuous, maybe we can even build in this quote. But your speed and your smarts were never what made you who you are. It's your anger. That's your superpower. That's what made you one of the best midfielders in the history of this league. You know, I don't think we're really shown enough evidence to conclude this convincingly. However, it's a reasonable theory to wonder about. Does Nathan Shelley want to be like Roy Kent? 
strong and commanding, where anger becomes a superpower in the eyes of a man who himself keeps very withdrawn. Is that why Nate opts for a similar suit to Roy? Is that why, when wearing the suit, he impulsively goes to kiss Keely, Roy's girlfriend? I want to feel and be somebody like Roy. Which of course makes a certain change very interesting. Roy Kent was forced to retire as a footballer around the same time Nate moves from Kitman to become a coach. And Nate enjoys his new role, chipping in more ideas, handling more sessions, sometimes even reassuring Ted with advice. The team's playing well, Ted, just a little unlucky, that's all. Except results aren't going their way. Ted decides a change is needed and brings in Roy as another coach, a change that happens quite suddenly without consulting anyone and you can see in Nate's face his immediate feelings about this. Is Nate upset because bringing in another coach goes against Nate's advice that they have just been unlucky so far? Does bringing in another coach make Nate feel undervalued? Why am I not enough? Why do we need someone else to come into? But Roy Kent in particular. If he is the man Nate in part attempts to emulate, then the actual Roy coming in would feel very much like a clear rival. He is who I want to be, I can't play that role with him around. And in the context of a rival, the fact he does kiss Keely makes even more sense, placing himself in a position to rival for her affections. Less because he wants Keely exactly so much as he wants to feel like Roy, like he could be a rival to Roy. After all, what appears to matter to him most most isn't whether or not Keeley finds him attractive, but whether or not his actions anger Roy. Nate is quick to confess what he's done. Tell me about it. Is that okay? I, I kissed her. I kissed your girlfriend. We good. But all Jamie did was talk to him and you wanted to kill him. Don't you at least want a headbutt me? Jamie is seen as a threat and a rival. Why not me? I want to be a rival. I want you to be angry. Made a mistake, mate. Don't worry about it. No, no, I deserve to be headbutted. This moment is incredibly belittling for Nate. Roy shows less forgiveness so much as a disregard for Nate, and it hurts. It's a blow to the image he's trying to cultivate for himself, which is to be someone strong now, someone commanding, someone like a boss. And we're going to come back to this in just a moment, because Nathan was, as far as he saw himself, someone very low down on the pecking order when he was the kit man. Now he's a first team coach who will even take charge when Ted has a panic attack and he will make the front page and be given interviews. Externally his position has changed, he is someone with power now. And if he defines power as being a tough macho man who commands others then that will obviously affect what he does with his newfound power but we'll get to that. I said there were two things to say about that moment with Nate's suit in the funeral. The second is Keeley's reaction. Well, well no, you don't buy all my clothes. Most of them are gifts from my mum. Keeley finds this sweet and endearing, but there's something slightly belittling about this too. Like, Nathan is a harmless little boy rather than a man. Sweet, but nothing more than sweet, you know? There are moments where Keeley is faintly like a mother figure to Nathan in the show, which perhaps the fact she does take him out to buy a suit fits into. You know, if Nathan felt that Ted buying him a suit was infantilizing and doesn't fit into this new, stronger image he's trying to cultivate, Keely taking him out to buy a suit may feel exactly the same again. If it's important to him, why doesn't Nathan go out and buy his own suit, you know? Why does he come to her office, hug the cushion tight and say, Can you make me famous? I've got the suit Ted bought you back from the dry cleaners. Oh, it's my suit. The second Ted gave it to me, ownership transferred and it became my suit. Well, as much as Nathan wants to project a stronger, more adult image in terms of how he sees himself, not to say I think it is at all childish asking for help, it's not, but it feels that to Nate, so as much as he tries to project a more macho image, let's say, internally that's not how he is behaving and presenting himself, because that's not how he feels deep down. And he might get frustrated and resent when anyone seems to notice this more childlike, as he sees it, side of himself, but ultimately it's still him who's partly giving off that dynamic. You know, dynamics work two ways. I hope what I'm saying there makes sense. Look, um, Nathan doesn't want to be treated like a kid, or what he sees as being treated like a kid. This Keely give seems to sting Nathan. Jan's comment cuts deep to his feelings. Another man buying you 
close is infantilizing, yes? I guess what I'm trying to say is others treating Nathan in ways that make him feel infantilized, and his frustration about that feeds a level of bitterness, but at the same time, also searching for others like parental figures to treat him like what he sees as a child. I think Nate's Freudian slip about the phrase Wonderkind instead accidentally describing himself as Wonder Kid. It's not like I'm some kind of Wonder Kid. <laughs> some kind of what? Wonder Kid. I think you mean Wonderkind, yeah? Hints at the side of him that does still feel like a child. Asking others for help shouldn't have to be infantilizing or feel infantilizing, and yet somehow something about the way Nathan asks for help creates that slight feel to it. The problem isn't concretely so much that nobody takes me seriously as a threat or sees me as a man or a rival or any of that stuff. The problem is more the fact of Nate feeling that about himself. I guess we can even come back to when I said the fact we feel sympathy for Nathan as an audience was important. This poor, bullied kid man who struggles to speak his mind. I should hope we feel some empathy too, but it is partly sympathy not empathy. Feeling sorry for him but not necessarily connecting to the pain ourselves. Like, um, there's moments where Nathan gets trapped in the luggage compartment of the bus and it's played for a laugh and we sympathise that poor man but we don't really feel the excruciating pain that would be. Not just how uncomfortable to be stuck in that bus but how humiliating as a grown man working as an employee of this club. I guess I'm saying the show directs us not to be with him in that pain because Nathan is just this sweet, harmless man we care for like a child. Same way we're not truly with him in the excruciating anxiety that happens subtly in the background here. We're given focus enough for the joke and for sympathy but not drawn to much else. I hope that makes sense, it's hard to explain it clearly. It just points to a lot of the unconscious feelings Nate interjects on behalf of this group though, being that role as the innocent, helpless one that people look out for, people try to help, but to see as an equal? In part I think they do start to see him as an equal, yes, they value him and promote him, but He's still harmlessly innocent in Keeley's eyes, in Roy's eyes. Perhaps, you may wonder, does Ted still see him that way? Anyway, let's rein this all back to an actual point, because I'm getting a bit lost in tangents, and I don't think I'm really... Um, I'm losing some of the thread of what I'm trying to say. <laughs> One of Nathan's great struggles is that he doesn't feel grown up. As I said, the wonderkind, wonder kids, Freudian slip is the best example. He doesn't feel like a grown man who deserves and is fit for the role he's playing as first team coach, but like a wonder kid, someone below that role who happens to be punching up because of his talent. That's a subtle difference, but an important one, I think. It is a natural, common struggle to feel like a child in adults' clothes, I think. It's a struggle I reckon almost all of us can empathise with, certainly myself in ways I've discussed in the past on this channel. The thing is though, with Nathan that's not just to do with confidence and self-esteem as often tends to be on a more basic level. Which I think is actually why the argument that Nathan just needs some more confidence doesn't prove true. If we take everything we've touched on so far, we can say Nathan is deeply harsh on himself, probably looks on himself as someone weak, and therefore seems to idealise those of strength and power. So much so that when given a little power of his own, he tries to craft a more commanding image for himself. Which perhaps actually may be why he's taken in by Rupert in season 2. Seeing Rupert not as a manipulative, narcissistic and dangerous man, but just as someone powerful that Nathan might want to learn from and replicate. And thirdly, Nathan feeling infantilised, and whilst one side of him can feel deeply grateful, almost too much so, and like a helpless boy requiring saving, another side of him is frustrated that he does ever feel like that, and therefore pushes back against it, I think. I reckon that is one half of why his attitude towards Ted essentially changes. Ted, who was this father figure in season one that helped Nate grow so much. Looking back on just how much he depended on Ted's help now makes him feel a bit weak and childlike, let's say. And so he partly wants to push back against or to rival Ted as though to assert, I never needed your help, I never felt dependent, I've always been capable on my own. Perhaps the same with his eagerness to push back and become a rival for Roy instead of this child beneath him that he partly felt in moments. 
I guess that's really the point. Being given this external growth in position and power and status within the club doesn't really boost Nathan's self-esteem internally so much as become a means to distance himself from the negative perception he has of himself. Anyway, with all of that in mind, let's take a look at Nathan's parents. We don't see much of his parents, admittedly. We kind of get one scene. We could tell a lot more if we were shown more, but what we can infer pretty bluntly is that Nate's dad doesn't appear to value him for anything. Never offers praise, never shows belief. In response to Nate making the front page for his successes as a coach, something any parent should be absolutely thrilled about, his dad first ignores it until Nate is forced to make a hint where he just says, They say humility is not thinking less of yourself thinking about yourself less. And that is such a painful moment. What more does Nate have to do to please him? Is there anything that can ever be done? He feels put down and undervalued by his father when that is the default familiar experience he comes to expect from his interactions with his dad. It's no surprise he fears scolding in almost every interaction with those he considers higher status to him. And the scolding that Nate pulls on himself too. He's no doubt grown up believing his dad or believing what he feels his dad believes of him. He doesn't seem to value me. Maybe he's right not to. Maybe it's my my fault. Maybe I am just fundamentally undeserving. And then as a result of concluding that, hating himself for how undeserving and unworthy he imagines himself to be, if we are speaking of power, no doubt does create a definition of power in Nathan's mind as this thing of tall, looming figures to who you feel tiny in comparison to. Towering presences, gods among men who can either act as saviours or completely destroy you. If that's what power is in Nathan's mind, then of course he wants it. Because either I have to feel like a small figure loomed over by people of power, or I get to be that looming powerful presence myself. The idea of a solid working relationship where sometimes others help you, sometimes you help them, you all chip in and support each other whenever someone needs it, that's quite a difficult concept for Nathan I think. Not impossible, there are times he does function as part of a positive team and that experience in itself is no doubt an important learning experience for him but at the same time when he smells weakness in another his instinct is to strike for opportunity. Ted has a panic attack, rather than seek to support him it feeds Nate's growing desire to take over as manager himself. What about his mum though? Um, from the scarce amount we're shown, she does at least seem to acknowledge Nate's success, only her attitude is still a bit, uh, more belittling, I guess. My little boy wonder. Kind of similar to Keely in that sense, seemed like a sweet boy more than a man. Uh, does that remember it's a wonder kid? Um, well, wonderkind, actually, is what I think I said. Mums, of course, can have a tendency to do this, or parents in general, wanting to keep their children as children rather than viewing them as adults. That is partly natural, but we can wonder if she perhaps takes it to an unhealthy extreme. Has Nathan grown up then feeling, as a result of his parents, perhaps like a helpless small child? I find this such a wonderful depiction of character because I think his parents do love him. I suspect if you ask, they'd say they care deeply, and Nathan would probably agree, but that doesn't mean something unhealthy isn't also happening in their relationship. Something that ideally needs to be addressed. If Nathan wants to grow beyond these feelings, the best way is to try and resolve and work with that dynamic between his parents. I don't think his father is intending to make him feel small and weak. I think he believes that not putting things to his head too much or showing too much praise and approval encourages Nathan to grow. I think that's his attitude and ideally Nathan can sit down and talk to him about that's not how it makes him feel. Not needing to directly criticise his dad, but to say, I know that's not what you mean to do, but it's how it makes me feel. It's not helpful. And the same with his mum. Having that difficult but hopefully worthwhile conversation. I think the reason just giving Nathan more of a role in the club, some value, all of that stuff, 
doesn't exactly fix things the way I guess it sort of does with Higgins. As I said, I think it's because none of this gives Nathan confidence so much as it gives him ego. The two aren't the same thing. Ego is about external stuff, external evidence you can use like proof to try and mask over the feelings beneath, whereas confidence is about genuinely internally feeling good. Look, I touched on this in my video about Jimmy Savile and in explaining narcissism. Narcissists don't actually think they're amazing deep down, really they think the total opposite. It's so terrible they deny the feeling, completely shut it out and spend their time finding external stuff to prove otherwise. Spending all the time thinking about how others perceive them, I guess, pouring over the validation from newspapers or online discussion, finding the right clothes to suit the image you want to create. If I look like someone powerful, if I act the way powerful people appear to act in my mind, maybe I'll actually feel that powerful too. And it is to that extent you can question is Nathan Shelley a narcissist? Perhaps a covert one? I'd say it's possible, I'd err uh, more on the side of seeing him with narcissistic traits rather than being a narcissist exactly, but it is a poignant question. Has Nathan spent his life desiring power, and yet always feeling wholly unable to obtain it, until Ted elevates his position in the community? Suddenly he has what he's always wanted, now what? He has two choices. One, lose it all again. I feel like I don't deserve this position, therefore I'm at a great, massive threat of losing it. Or two, fight like hell against this perceived threat he worries about. Seek more and more evidence to prove how unlike the bullied kit man he is. Being a coach isn't enough, next I need to run trainings, then to handle substitutions, take the headlines, be the boss, become a manager in my own right. Which I guess is dangerously addictive, because in the short term it does feel like it's healing your wounds. But it's not just that he does either, at the same time there's also the fact of projecting all those internal pain feelings outwards onto other people. It's no surprise such anger comes out in that roast scene. Not just to Isaac and Colin who bullied him either, but to anyone he can possibly make feel like the weak one for a change. His treatment of Will, the new kit man, is where most of his projected feelings go. Nathan really is downright cruel to him at times. Getting at him over every minute mistake as Nathan perceives it, all of the tiny, inconsequential things that Nathan has a habit of beating himself up for, now Will takes it. The spitting, I think, is also a great symbolic example. Rebecca tries to help Nathan become more assertive by showing him how she draws on this body language to psych herself up for important events and make herself feel more powerful. It's the sort of thing that can be effective in the short term, um, and she encourages Nathan to find something for himself which comes to be spitting on a mirror. Spitting on an image of himself. Partly I think this draws on something kind of primal and um, that, I guess, kind of macho-ness that he's looking for, but it's also spitting on what he sees as weakness and inadequacy. You are not strong. You are worthless, you can only do strong things when you spit on yourself and who you really are and pretend to be someone different. That's kind of the reverse of the message he needs. Nathan starts to resent Ted for being the boss where Nathan wants it for his own gratification. Needs it, although not needs exactly. Needing is an emotion that would make him feel desperate and dependent and weak again in his eyes, so what's a way of reinterpreting this desire that can feed the ego instead? He can conclude, I deserve to be the boss, it's not I need it to prop up my ego per se, it's that I'm entitled to it. Let's talk more about Ted. As I say, Nathan resents Ted having the role that Nathan desires and convinces himself he's entitled to. Ted then starts to become less a teammate than an obstacle in his eyes, and when he perceives weakness in Ted, of course that makes the resentment worse because it gives further evidence to feed the ego. Ted doesn't deserve this role, he's American, he doesn't understand the sport, he has panic attacks and leaves me to handle things, therefore he's incapable. I am capable. I can project all my negative feelings onto him. In truth, Ted's is 
incredibly capable really i do think in season two they um overdo his tactical stupidity at times that's true but he is incredibly capable in other ways that don't fit nathan's image of what a strong powerful leader is i think this is perhaps nate's greatest flaw never being able to recognize ted's strengths never appreciating the skills needed of a leader beyond that very traditional stereotype of a hard stern commanding presence Let's look at the scene where Nathan reveals his feelings to Ted. You made me feel like I was the most important person in the whole world. And then you abandoned me. The first part of that sentence is season one. Ted helping Nathan to grow, Nathan feeling like he depended on Ted for that growth at the time. The second sentence is all about Nathan's own interpretations affected by his feelings. Realistically, Ted didn't abandon him at all. He was less hands-on and encouraging towards Nathan, yes, but that's because Nathan had grown into someone who needed it less. To continue being hands-on would be patronising and suggest he doesn't trust Nathan to manage things on his own two feet. The change is really more to do with the fact Nate had started to resent how he felt dependent on Ted like a father figure and wanting a reason to feel like he doesn't depend on him anymore, which is to argue Ted's abandoned him and he's had to fight and earn everything for himself since then. You know, Ted is in many ways the reason Nate was able to grow from Kitman into first team coach. Realistically though, he doesn't depend on Ted for that. If he could just trust that he deserves his growth, he is worthy of his position, then he wouldn't feel any dependency at all. But if it's how he feels, then part of him now wants to push back against that feeling. But also maybe how Ted worked as a good father figure in direct contrast to his own real dad and how confusing that experience is. It's unfamiliar, I'm used to father figures who don't value me. If I've got one who does, does that mean my real dad is wrong? Should I be angry with him? No, I don't want to be angry with him, he's my dad, I'm supposed to love him. He's what's familiar too, Ted's approach to me is different and confusing and unfamiliar, therefore I'll attack it. Conclude none of his kindness was real, it was a trick, Ted must be full of shit, he abandons me just the same as anyone else does. And I, I worked my ass off trying to get your attention back, to prove myself to you, to make you like me again. You can more clearly see he's talking to his dad right now. It's so painful because this is exactly what he needs to be telling him, but he can't. His dad's too powerful and intimidating. I think in a healthy family relationship, you do go from an age where you depend on your parental figures massively and partly idealise them, to slowly becoming an equal in a way and supporting them sometimes as much as they support you. Ted is more receptive to his feelings, so rather than talk to his dad, he puts it all here instead. I think that is a testament to Ted's strength of character, to be able to draw out all that expression from Nathan, even if it is directed at the wrong person. But the more, the more I did, the less she cared. It's like I was fucking invisible. Like, despite all his success and new role, he still feels exactly the same deep down. Still feels like the invisible kit man. I've even got the, the photo I gave you for Christmas up in your office, just a picture of dumb Americans. And now you're gonna play Nate's false nine to when the team fuck up, which they will. Okay, he can blame it on me. Well, no, fuck that. Which Ted would 100% never do. He never shifts blame or steals credit, but it's an argument to further the idea that Ted is a fraud and Nate deserves his role. Everybody loves you. The great Ted Lasso, I, I think you're a fucking joke. Without me, you wouldn't have won a single match and they would have shipped your ass back to Kansas where you fucking belong, with your, with your son. Because you, you sure as hell don't belong here. So much projection going on here in a way that can, unfortunately, be realistic in certain situations. Ted fits in where Nate struggles to, or at least feels like he struggles to. I do think Nate actually does fit in quite well a lot of the time, but... In order to convince himself he's worthy of the manager role, Ted has to be the opposite undeserving, the way Nate feels about himself. I even wonder, though this is definitely a stretch, if there's a little bit of the go back to your own country foreigner type sting to Nate's words here, which is almost certainly something Nathan's parents were told, probably Nate himself growing up at times by racist elements of the community. A horrible thing to be told, and yet 
here is a rare chance for Nate to push that feeling onto somebody else for a change. Maybe. That is admittedly conjecture though. But I do. I belong here. This, di this didn't just fall into my lap, right? I, I earned this. I know you didn't, Nate. Following this, Ted tries to respond in a very kind and empathetic manner, but Nathan doesn't want to hear any of it. He tells Ted he's full of shit and storms off. Of course, Nathan doesn't want to hear any of it, because anything Ted says will go against the feelings Nate just projected onto him, perhaps even make him feel bad for attacking Ted so much, so he shuts it off and leaves. I need to be able to blame Ted for everything wrong, because that makes it easier for me. It's a terribly sad moment, one where there's very little Ted could do. Even as a counsellor, sometimes moments like this aren't ones to talk them through it, sometimes all they're ready for right now is to vent all the anger, dump you with the projected feelings and see how you work with them. Maybe a chance can come later to talk about and to rework this view, but we don't know if there is a chance or not, we never see. Following this match, our next sight of Nathan, the cliffhanger ending, is him as the newly appointed manager of Rupert's club, West Ham. I know this has been long and my throat is dying a little, but we're going to quickly touch on where I imagine things could go for Nathan next in Season 3. For Season 3, Nathan has very much set himself up to be Ted's rival, but it's very complicated. I think what Nathan wants and what Nathan needs are going to be in direct conflict with each other throughout the third series. What he wants will obviously be great fame and success. His ego will feed on social media recognition and on results. Plus he'll want Ted to fail. We already saw at the end of the second season how he resented Ted's success because Ted failing would prove himself more worthy. What he needs however I think is both a chance to try and resolve his feelings and dynamics with his parents but also perhaps a level of reconciliation with Ted. I don't think Nathan's burns their bridges entirely, I think Ted is a very forgiving person. It instead comes down to whether or not Nate can stomach the shame and guilt I guess and let himself apologise, or if those feelings are so unbearable he pushes them away and doubles down that Ted is a joke and a fraud and needs to be sent back to Kansas. Why does Nate need reconciliation with Ted? I think because he has been the closest thing to a positive father figure. For someone who expects scolding and shame, who may very well hit their lowest points if things at West Ham go wrong, he'll need someone very much like Ted to remind him it's okay, to tell him truly he isn't worthless, he's not a failure, that his whole self-esteem does not depend on success. Something which I suspect is the total opposite message to what his dad has been telling him the whole life, and is a total opposite message to what Rupert will probably tell him. I really hope Nate's new relationship to Rupert gives us space to see more about him as a character, because we've technically seen very little of Rupert. He's been on the periphery, but I think season 3 will be the time for Rupert to more concretely grow into the main antagonist. Honestly, I think things will go terribly wrong for Nate as a manager. He's got the tactical understanding and the ability to coach people, but he altogether fails to grasp exactly what Ted's skill is and why he made such a difference to Richmond FC. Ted knows how to bring people together into a harmonious squad and how to help them be the best possible versions of themselves, inside and out. Nathan can't do that because he's kind of too lost in his own pain, too caught up projecting feelings of worthlessness onto those below him. He was downright horrible to Colin. He can be downright vicious when the team performs badly, which, yes, in certain circumstances can work in coaching. Good managers know when to give their players an absolute bollocking, but that's always about getting them fired up, never about breaking them down. Even the toughest of football managers always understand the value of respecting their players, of knowing their limits and of knowing when something other than a bollocking is required. Nathan has the capability to do well, but when things turn sour, his defensiveness may take over. I think for him to succeed he needs a really 
really good team of coaches and an assistant manager around him that can take charge in places where he's weak. He would need to be more a uh, removed manager who just handles the tactical stuff and leaves the kind of running and man management and squad building to the assistants below him. Is he likely to get that in his backroom staff? Is he likely to let them support him and to delegate that kind of role? Not impossible, but also I don't think likely, no. I just don't think Nathan's ready for this role and I think it's set him up very much so for a fall. That I guess is one of the great downsides of chasing ego and um, external fulfilment in that way. Sometimes you're not always quite ready for the roles you desire. That's where he would need Ted. Would Nathan seek him out? Rupert is his boss now and very manipulative and a powerful man who is just the sort of person Nathan is easily susceptible to. I hope when things do wrong he can find a safety net in Ted's, which is really kind of what I see happening for the season. Nathan will be the villain who ultimately becomes the victim of Rupert and then has to try and find redemption. And the reason I think Rupert needs to become a more integral character now is because that's Really the one thing this show has alluded to yet not truly confronted yet. How to deal with or what to think about the toxic people in our lives I guess. Jamie was open enough and young enough to be able to change with Ted's great skill. So was Rebecca but Jamie's dad, Rupert, Nate. The show is yet to concretely say too much on the issue, which I think has been right, that's no criticism, it's a topic that deserves a spot as a main plotline, not to be crammed into the first two seasons. Hopefully season 3 provides that space. Largely I'm very eager to see where the show goes next. Season 2 had some flaws, but where it mattered most it delivered an impactful punch and I'm hoping season 3 can do the same. So yeah, I think I've touched on most of the things I wanted to say. I will end with a point about aggression and just say that being aggressive doesn't make a person strong. Often it's actually a form of weakness disguised as strength. Keely and Rebecca encouraged Nathan to be more assertive, but in part he understood that to mean aggressive instead. I think I said something like that in my Sopranos therapy analysis actually. Being strong isn't about making others feel weak, that's to do with projection. Strength is about empowering those around you as much as yourself. I hope you got something from this video. Let me know all the stuff I've inevitably missed or gotten wrong. Build on all of this in the comments if you can. Um, and obviously like the video if you liked it, subscribe if you want more stuff from me. Support me on Patreon if you want to help keep the channel going, but otherwise... Hopefully see you next time. And as ever, a special thank you guys to Janice McMahon, Luke Hoare, Chichu Kaber, Michael Gallagher, In Squares, Dustin Paulson, Samara Salsi, Sharecroft to 14, Joshua C. Follier and Chad Bramwell. Thank you.